Louis Palau, the former evangelist, met with one government official from Argentina. His goal for that meeting was to plan an evangelistic crusade in Argentina uh, after their war with Great Britain. Palau believed the gospel of Jesus Christ could be the best thing to heal this war-torn nation. This was in the uh, late 20th century. Great Britain and Argentina, you may not even remember, had a very uh, brief war, a skirmish that cost the lives of many. And Palau, having this government official's attention, after all the details were finalized for his crusade, asked, look, I know you'll be talking off the record, but I want to ask on behalf of thousands of of South Americans, how did this war begin? No one really knows. It seemed senseless and pointless, but how did this war between Great Britain and Argentina start? And the government official smiled and said, famously now, it started because two bald guys argued over a comb. Now that is not the first time uh, senseless acts of war that have cost hundreds of thousands of lives began in strange, silly ways. Arguably, the greatest rivalry in American history is the rivalry between the Hatfields and the McCoys, West Virginia versus Kentucky, that cost dozens of lives from each of those families, and the feud went on record at least for over a hundred years. It all started over a dispute of a marking of the ear of a pig. And then we were led into bloodshed for decades. And that shot heard round the world of the American Revolution actually started by a discharge of a British musket that was not pointed at American colonists, but pointed in the air on the march. And that caused eight years of bloodshed in our country and a revolution against Britain. In the opening chapters of 2 Samuel, we have something similar occurring. A, a seven-year war that lasted, a civil war that broke out, costing the lives of thousands of men, women, boys and girls in this country that was so unnecessary for it to be fought. You might recall that news in the early part of 2 Samuel had arrived to David about the death of King Saul, Israel's first king. He died on Mount Gilboa in a battle against the Philistines. He and three of his four sons fell that day. So Israel's throne was vacant. But everyone in Israel knew that the prophet of God, Samuel, had anointed David to be the next king that Yahweh wanted. Not only did all of Israel know, but critical figures in Israel's court knew this. Michael, for example, Saul's daughter, knew that David was to be the next king and protected him once upon a time. Jonathan, the heir apparent of the throne, the prince of Israel, knew that David was to be the next king and actually did an act of a transfer of power in 1 Samuel to that end. And even the maniac Saul knew and confessed publicly that David was to be the next king of Israel. Everyone knew that David was God's choice in king. And so it seemed to be a smooth transition. David hears about Saul's death. He leaves Ziklag, the land of the Philistines, where he and his troops have been held up for 18 months. He comes back into the land of Judah, his home, and the next day he's there in Hebrew and he's anointed king of Judah. So now the process for his campaign has started. One down, he needs 11 more votes before he is officially installed as king over Israel. This ought to be easy. Everyone knows. So he's got one in his pocket in Judah. Then he begins, we saw this last week, his campaign. 
He goes to Jabesh Gilead and asks for their vote. But they hedge on it. They will not give up their cards so easily. And while David is in the midst of campaigning to be installed, to be the king that everyone knows he ought to be, then we have civil war that breaks out. Saul's last and remaining son, Ishbosheth, is installed on the throne of Israel in concert with David being anointed as king over Judah. This is a rivalry now. Then there is this guy who really pushes it in motion. We talked about him last week. His name is Abner. We read for probably what seemed like an eternity today. And Abner seems to take center stage. In 2 Samuel chapter 2 and 3, we wonder why. We've been told by this pulpit, by myself, that David and Saul and Samuel seem to be the main characters of 1 and 2 Samuel. Why does the historian take so many verses to describe this guy? Well, let's back up a minute and give the macro, the broad picture to this. 1 and 2 Samuel are history books, remember? So our historian, whoever he or they are who writes 1 and 2 Samuel, writes from the perspective of telling stories, which as a history professor, I believe that that's the way history ought to be taught personally, is through the act of storytelling. The authors of 1 and 2 Samuel are teaching history to Israel in the form of telling stories. And one of the main themes in 1 Samuel has been this contrast, this intersection between the house of David and the house of Saul. That David, God's spirit was always on and always would be. And everything David did was blessed of God. Whereas Saul, after that debacle with the Amalekites in chapter 15, the spirit leaves him never to return again. And from that time forth, everything Saul does goes to pot. He has the reverse King Midas touch. Everything he touches turns south. It is one story of failure after failure after failure for King Saul. And he dies in failure in a battle. Now, after he dies... His house continues to try to reign on the throne of Israel. But you and I both know this won't last because we've read the end of the story, but also because you and I remember when God stripped Saul of his blessing of being king, the prophet Samuel also said, neither will any of your offspring rule. So this is a foregone conclusion. We know the end of the story. Amazingly, so does Abner, this guy who is now center stage. And I think to answer the question, why chapter 2 and 3 of 2 Samuel? Why all these stories and why about Abner? He is representing the house of Saul that fails in everything they do. And he picks up where Saul left off. And there are three primary stories in 2 Samuel 2. Two and three, we're going to look at quickly today. I call them three strikes or three failures. We have first in chapter two, verses 12 through the end of the chapter, Abner's dismal failure in battle. And that's saying something. He fails in battle and he is a decorated five star general. The second story begins in chapter 3 and runs the first 11 verses, is Abner's failure in his plotting and planning to lead Israel. He fails at that. And the third abysmal failure runs verse 12 through the end of chapter 3, is Abner's failure to negotiate peace. So he can't fight right, he can't negotiate peace right, And none of his plans go right. This is one big joke after the other. Now this is important because Abner is not only Saul's commanding general of the armies of the north and thereby Ishbosheth's, 
Abner is also Saul's cousin. Remember, Abner was sitting with Saul opposite of David and Jonathan at all those banquets. So Abner has a vied interest in ensuring that the house of Saul remains on the throne. Because as long as they do, politically, he's got clout. So he is this officer uh, in, in the army. Now, I don't know if you've ever heard the expression, uh, to do the same thing over and over again, expecting different results is the definition of stupidity. Well, that's Abner. He tries the same thing over and over again in our story, and with each turn, three of them, he fails at. And again, the broad picture is to show us God is not going to bless the house of Saul no matter how much they huff and puff. He will bless David. He'll put him on the throne. Now, the interest of our story is it takes seven years from chapter 2 to when David finally becomes king of all Israel. What should have taken place immediately takes seven long years because man gets involved, starts a civil war to try to frustrate God's will. And so we see these truths converge. Well, let's look at it quickly. First, the first scene is Abner trying to resist God's will by force. Abner really, in chapter 2 and 3, is sort of our exhibit of what a sinner is like, trying to resist God's will by force. Now, we, we read a lot of stories, and they're somewhat comical and somewhat bizarre and foreign to us. We we definitely need to understand Near Eastern culture, and I won't bore you with all that. I will bring it up once because it's important you see it as we go on in the text. But you get this 12-on-12 12 12 matchup with one-on-one -on -one combat, and they duel to the death, and they fight a war, and all this may get lost on you. The point being, what you need to see about Abner, what I think the historian, is that Abner is the aggressor in this war. He's the one that starts it. And it's very important you see this because what comes will not make sense. There are two primary ways we know he is the instigator in trying to frustrate the plan of God to have David installed as king. Number one is his speeches in chapter 2 verses 12 to the end of the chapter. He does a lot of saber rattling. He gets his troops worked up in a frenzy. We're going to war. We're going to attack the Judeans. The other evidence you need in the text that he's the instigator is geography, because geography doesn't lie. Let me give you an example. Let's suppose you walked in uh, the church this morning and you discovered it had been vandalized. Uh, windows were shattered. Furniture was turned over and ripped. Doors were knocked out, equipment was stolen, graffiti was sprayed on our walls, and you and I would be horrified. Who would do this to the house of God? And after an investigation, we find out that a bunch of hoodlums from Lee Summit in the dead of night came over to do it. If we're, we, we wouldn't know, need to know anything about them personally to know that they were the aggressors. Here we are, minding our own business, our building stands firmly fixed at 83rd and Lackman, and people had to cross state lines, county lines, come into Lenexa and do their bidding and then steal away in the night. And so when we read the geography here of where Abner was and where Judah was and how Abner had to take his army, cross the Jordan River and attack, he is the aggressor. But he wants us to think he's the victim. He's the ultimate passive-aggressive personality disorder who starts the fight, gets to play the victim, and then blame other people for it. And that's exactly what he does. He marches his army into Judah. He hits Judah by force, but he loses the battle. And he retreats. And what he doesn't realize is while he is a very good general, although from chapter 2 and chapter 3 he doesn't win anything, 
he is met by a formidable opponent who is the general of David's armies now, this guy Joab, who's a relative as well of David. And Joab is the commanding general, five-star general, and he has two brothers who sort of are his brigadier generals, Abishai and Asahel. And during this skirmish, during this battle that ensues, and Abner cries retreat, he flees. And Asahel, who's described, you know, as fast as a gazelle, he's probably the general of the cavalry of, Israel, of Judah, he gets on his horse and he pursues Abner. And he overtakes Abner. And he gets into a battle, a one-on-one -on -one with Abner, and Abner kills Asahel, Joab's brother, one of the generals of Israel. Later on in the story, Abner then gets to play the victim. He says, look, Asahel pursued me. I had to defend myself. And Joab retorts, that never would have happened had you not come into Judah and invaded us to begin with and fought us. So Abner here is the aggressor, but now he plays passive. I don't know if you ever had to deal with passive aggressive personality disorders. They are the worst kind of people to deal with. Because they're all, they hit first, they're the ones that start it, they get to back up and play the victim, and then you're the bad guy for trying to clean up the... And that's exactly what happens in the story. So Asahel dies, and now Joab is seething with revenge. That will come to take place in chapter 3. Now I bring all this first story up, that Abner really does represent your typical sinner who makes a royal mess of their life through decisions they have made, and then they turn around and blame God for it. So let's look at our first father in the garden, Adam, who takes the fruit from Eve and then eats it. And at that moment, Scripture scholars tell us, Adam sinned. It was in his taking and his action that caused the downfall of man. At that moment... Adam is the aggressor of God. But after that action, what does Adam do? He blames his wife, and if you read the sentence thoroughly, he blames God for creating the wife to begin with. So now, it is God's fault for causing Adam to do. Had you never created the woman, this would have never happened. So Adam is really our first personality disorder of scriptures. But that is representative of what happens when a man falls into sin. Everything in his life gets topsy-turvy. And Adam's children play the role of Abner. We are the ones who commit that sin. And then when the consequences come, we play victim. How could you do this, God? Why are you so mean? Why are you so unloving when we're the ones who got ourselves in that mess to begin with? So Abner teaches us that there is a great failure in trying to frustrate the plan of God. Finally, or secondly, we see this contrast of two stories in chapter 3, particularly the first six verses. What the historian is teaching us here is that the kingdom of God will go on in spite of men's frustrating it. Uh, even though David will not get to become fully king of Israel years to come, nevertheless God is still blessing him. So chapter 3 verse 1, he keeps getting stronger. That's what the text tells us as a sign that God's hand is on David. And then we have evidence of him getting stronger. He takes on multiple wives, and he who bears him multiple sons, which in that world is seen as God's blessing. What's interesting is this is paired against Abner's manufacturing of God's blessing in the very next verse. In verse 6, Abner seeks to make himself strong and be blessed, but he takes a woman by force. Uh, he goes and takes Saul's harem, Saul's concubine. 
and this is the downfall. And it always is that way. At the downfall and skirmish between two men is usually always over a woman or some sex act, and we have it here. Now, this is the one place I'm going to try to explain Near Eastern culture. So Abner takes Saul's harem, Saul's dead. In the Near East, when a guy took another guy's harem, particularly a king, it was a sign for everyone of succession, of transfer of power. And depending on the act, it could also be a sign of humiliation. So for example, we'll get to this, later on in 2 Samuel, Absalom, David's son, in revolution, marches into Jerusalem. He has outnumbered David's forces. David is a man that's got to run, and he runs away quickly. He has to, to save his life. And he leaves behind all of his wives. And when Absalom invades Jerusalem, one of the first acts, it's vile, he takes all of David's wives and all of David's concubines, he takes them up in a chamber so that everyone knows what's happening. And he does it to humiliate his father, but also as a picture of transfer of power. Who's the boss now? That's exactly what Abner is doing. He's taking Saul's concubine... And he's tell, letting everyone know that Ishbosheth, the one on the throne, he's just a puppet. He's a weakling. He's just a face. But the real power in this country of Israel now belongs to me. And so he takes Saul's harem to demonstrate that. Well, Ishbosheth is no dummy. He knows what this is about. He knows this is a power struggle. And he's not going to lay down for Abner. Abner thinks that. But he's not going to lay down, and so they get into this argument over this woman. And Abner leaves in a huff, like a kid who can't get his way, and he takes all of the armies of the north, all of Israel's main army, and he marches down to Judah, and he surrenders his sword, surrenders his army to David, and he allies with David later. But during this skirmish, he threatens Ishbosheth with this. He says, I'm just going to defect. I'll take all the armies if this is the way you're going to be. You know, you need to know your place, king. And Ishbosheth is terrified that he'll do that, which he does it. And so we have this very sordid way in the second, uh, the, 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 the second scene. I want, before I move on, to point out that during this argument, Abner really gives up his cards. Notice what he says in verses 9 and 10 of chapter 3. May God act against Abner, and terribly so, if I do not do for him as Yahweh has sworn to David, namely, to transfer the kingdom from the house of Saul and to raise up the throne of David over Israel and over Judah from Dan as far as Beersheba. What is Abner doing? Did you catch it? Abner is admitting that David is God's man. Abner is admitting God wants David on the throne, and I'm going to make that happen, Ishbosheth, if you don't give me what I want. So Abner now is telling the world what he has known. And by the way, he has known this. Remember, Abner was Saul's chief bodyguard when David snuck into the camp and could have pinned Saul to the ground with that spear, who was sleeping next to Saul? Abner was, because David embarrasses him the next day. Who was it next to Saul at those banqueting tables opposite of Jonathan David? It was Abner. Abner knows that David is God's man, and he says it here, which really gets to the point of sin's insanity in our lives. Abner knows that it is a foregone conclusion David will be on the throne as God's man, yet he fights against him anyway. He declares war against him anyway. Seven years of blood is shed because this man fights against the will of God he knows better. And isn't this like sinners? We know that the sin we commit is going to hurt our loved ones. Who cares? We're going to do it anyway. We know that what we do in our behavior will harm the testimony of Christ. Who cares? We're going to do it anyway. 
We know that we will not get away ultimately with our sin, but we're still going to do it. We know that God's agenda will not be defeated, but we're still going to do it anyway. This is the insanity of sin, you see. But I am, you know, not completely believe that Abner's confession here is as pure and clean as the wind-driven snow. I think, uh, in fact, I know because the text hints at this, that Abner's confession is not purely theological as it is political. He is threatening Ishbosheth with taking his armies to David, which he does, probably thinking that David will reward me with some post. And so, uh, you know, what we see here that a lot of people are driven by politics. Uh, Donald Gray Barnhouse, I remember, told a story of a 10 year old by the name of Tommy. Tommy and his best friend are out ice skating in the dead of winter in Vermont. They get on their skates, and Tommy's friend goes out first, gets to the middle of the pond, and crashes through the ice. Tommy, without his skates on, runs out, slides on his stomach, and rescues his best friend, Uh, pulls him out of the pond and takes him to shore. Other people see this act of bravery, spontaneous courage, and they can't believe a 10-year-old boy would be such quick-witted to do this, to risk his life. A lady interviews Tommy later and says, what, what made you think just you, you gave it no thought, really? You just instantly jumped up and rescued your friend. And Tommy said, well, he had my skates on. <laughs> you know, this, Abners don't disappear. They just change their name. Like Simon the Magician in the New Testament, who said, I want the Holy Spirit, name your price. I've been a pastor long enough that every so often when people leave a church, whether it's Calvary or others, and I'm not talking about in every instance, I'm talking about people who leave disgruntled. Nine times out of ten, 9.9 times out of ten, it's not a theological reason, it's a political one. And I don't mean Democrats, Republicans, I mean you're not giving me what I want and so I'm leaving. You're not doing what I say, and so I'm leaving. Or you hurt my feelings, and so I'm leaving. This is Abner, you see, working because of politics. So, church, while we sing onward Christian soldiers, let us remember that there's always mercenaries in our ranks. The final set of stories is really broken up into really fast-paced stories about Abner's negotiation here. Uh, he's getting ready to defect. He threatens Ishbosheth. And David uh, goes through these long dialogue of negotiations and dealings with Abner. The first is that he sends word to Ishbosheth that before they negotiate terms or peace treaty, that he will demand that his wife, Michael, be sent back to him. Now let me just review this story because you won't understand the depth of sorrow that this first chapter of this first story has. You might remember Michael. It's been a while since we visited her. It probably has been a decade since David has seen her. Close. Michael was Saul's daughter. Remember that Saul put up as a trophy and reward for anyone who would defeat Goliath. And David does it and gets Michael as the prize. And so Michael, from the get-go, is treated like a piece of meat by her dad. This is a woman that probably throughout her life, with some exceptions, doesn't know how to be treated with dignity. This is a woman, in several stories, treated like property. And it all starts, and the blame can be put at her dad's feet, because he started this. So David gets her in exchange for his victory over Goliath, and it appears, at least in 1 Samuel, it won't wind up this way, but it starts off that they genuinely love each other. Because remember, Michael protects David from Saul and his henchmen. 
He's in bed. She sees them coming. She says, get out, escape. And she lies to her dad to protect her husband that I think she genuinely loves then. David has to escape from Saul, gets hunted for Saul. That lasts a decade. And somewhere during that time of flight, Saul, as an act of revenge of David, takes Michael and gives her to another man. We meet him in this story. And I don't know, Scripture doesn't say, but I can only imagine what any woman would think. Okay, uh, I'm being taken by force from my first husband who's on the run and given to another. My first husband's going to come back and bust heads, right? My boyfriend's back and you're good. But that never happened. David never came to pursue Michael. So maybe she was bitter. We don't know. She clearly was a bitter woman. We're going to see this in the future. Clearly bitter toward David about something. And evidently, her second husband and her grow to love one another. Certainly, the text clearly indicates her second husband loves her deeply, treats her well. And David In this negotiation, remember now he's king of Judah. He's a big boss man. He goes to Ishbosheth, her brother, the king of Israel on the throne, and he negotiates and he says, before we even start the talks, this is a a deal breaker. Before we even start negotiating, I want Michael back. And so the story tells a rather uh, rather sad story here of uh, not only David's shrewd negotiations, but in verses 15 through 16, Michael's second husband, not being able to do anything as his wife is ripped from his house, sit, sat on a horse and sent to Judah. And he sits there completely incapacitated to fight against two kings for his woman. And the text says, as he is brokenhearted and sad, All of this happened because a long time ago, a dad treated his daughter like a piece of property. And now here she goes again, being exchanged from one man to the next. Now David, for his part, is a shrewd negotiator. This probably is as much political as it is personal. Because David recognizes, yeah, this is my first wife. And he's got many wives at this point. But this particular woman is the daughter of Saul. And I'm in a civil war against her brother. And if she comes over to me, which is what he's asking, to Judah, that is going to be seen by the rest of Israel as the only daughter of Saul has now gone over, left her brother's side, and gone over and allied with David as Judah. So it's going to be a major PR thing. The other thing we need to see about this story, not to get lost in the weeds, is how David treats Abner in the negotiation. He does not, and this is on purpose, this is a big deal, he does not negotiate for Michael with Abner directly. He goes directly to Ishbosheth and does an end run around Abner and Abner in effect becomes the middleman and what David is doing is he's cutting Abner down several notches you're not as big as you think you are I'm not going to treat you like an equal by negotiating for Michael with you and he goes to Ishbosheth and does this and for all of Abner's huffing and puffing he has shown that he's powerless The second thing that David does to knock Abner down a notch or two is he rewards him and grants him immunity, which you didn't do with a rival ruler. You did it with a submissive citizen. So Abner comes now to David and his forces. He leaves Ishbosheth, brings the armies of the north, and we're told three times, verses 21 through 23 of chapter 3, that Abner goes off in peace. David is not going to use Abner's killing of Asahel against him. He gives him freedom. And we know that because Abner leaves his guard down. 
He thinks he's okay. Joab hears about this. Joab is Asahel's brother, the general. He comes back and he hears what David has done and he's livid. Because he thinks that Abner is a confederate. So Joab, unbeknownst to David, going against David's wishes, brings Abner to a secret meeting. And when he's at that meeting, Joab takes a hidden dagger and rams it up his stomach. And he collapses and dies. And he does it for the revenge of his brother. David hears about this. And he is livid. Not only because Joab has defied David's uh, immunity order, but because, again, of the PR optics. David is now telling Joab, what have you done? Because now all of Israel that I'm trying to unite under my reign, they're going to be thinking I'm just like Saul, that my word is no good, that I actually kill off rivals. I gave this man my word that he was free, and you've gone and undermined me, and all of Israel is going to think my word can be easily broken. So then our last scene of these long chapters of stories is David playing quite the role, going overboard to make Israel know he had nothing to do with this killing. Notice what he does in verse 28 of chapter 3. He publicly asserts his innocence. Verse 29, he calls down what can only be called a scathing curse on Joab's household for this murder in verse 29. Then, (laughs) to, to add insult to injury, verse 31, he orders Joab and his troops to participate in public mourning for Abner, the guy he killed. Then, David, this is remarkable. He's a king. Verse 32, David walks behind the hearse, the the casket, and he walks behind it publicly mourning over the soul and body of Abner and gets to the grave and weeps openly and audibly for all to see. Then, if that's not enough... After the funeral's over, in verses 33 and 34, David goes back to court and writes an official lament, lamenting the death of Abner. And then he doesn't stop there. In verse 35, he uses his kingly authority to issue a national fast of mourning on behalf of Abner. And all of this, verse 37 convinces the nation of Israel that David is guiltless of complicity in Abner's death. So Abner's failure is rewarded in his own murder. This lesson for sinners is that our sin will never be ultimately rewarded. People sin because they think they can get away with it. People sin because they think it will give them happiness. People sin because they want other people to like them. But ultimately, as we see with Abner, it will never be rewarded. Now finally, our last lesson is a lesson of great hope for David. While we do not see David reigning as king over Israel yet, that will be several chapters coming. So we should pause in chapters 2 and 3 and look at the light of the whole for our own encouragement. Chapters 2 and 3 cause us to marvel at Yahweh's promise regarding David's kingship will eventually come to pass, for all people who resist God's kingdom will do it by force and won't get away with it. Now we should remember this in our own day, because it looks like in the culture we live in, that the church is in a decisive minority. It looks like we are in and are headed for dark days as God's people. We are certainly living in days where right is wrong and wrong is right and everything's pear-shaped and topsy-turvy. And we wonder if the church will succeed in its endeavors to bring glory to God in this world. But chapters 2 and 3 remind us 
Though sinners and foes of God's kingdom may hurl their greatest weapons at us, ultimately, in the end, they will fail. And the church and God's kingdom will advance in all of its glory. No Abner, no Joabs of our life will be able to stop Christ church from its advancement. Father, I thank you for this assembly, for their patience. Lord, even for these stories that um, sometimes are hard to wrap our head around because they, in a culture we know not of, but we're thankful that sin, though very grotesque, very stubborn, will not be ultimately effective. And for your glory and for your renown, your church will continue to triumph. We pray this in Jesus' name and for your sake. Amen.